you, Todd. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you to the UCLA uh, department for inviting me. It's an honor. A pleasure to speak to you here. I haven't been uh, to UCLA before. It's the first time I've spoken, so uh, it's kind of kind of fun to meet everyone and see uh, see people who I ordinarily only see at conferences. Uh, to start out, I would like to say uh, that the work I'm going to talk about primarily today is uh, work I've done with uh, my colleague and friend Guy Blalock for a number of years at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, two of our PhD students in particular, uh, John Greiner and Dan Spoonhauer, and I'd like to really uh, you know, give them a lot of uh, credit, and you can uh, heap all the blame and criticism on me because probably I'll uh, manage to uh, mangle it in some way that they wouldn't approve of, but uh, I'll do my best to give a fair accounting of our work. So uh, what I would like to do is, uh, as Todd uh, mentioned, what I want to do in this talk is I would like to use as a, uh, my starting point is what I call the great rift in computer science, which is the, uh, the separation uh, between two different theories of computer science. Uh, there is the, and which I will call in a somewhat uh, tongue-in-cheek way, the American theory and Euro theory, especially the name Euro theory is uh, used uh, often pejoratively, but I'll, I'll wear that as a badge of honor. Uh, the, the, the difference being that in the US, you know, what what counts as theoretical computer science for the most part is uh, sort of combinatorics and algorithmic complexity and it has its roots in operations research and tracing all the way back to the earliest roots of computer science, especially uh, Turing's work. And Euro theory is uh, primarily focuses on semantics and logic and traces its roots all the way back to like Church's work and it's kind of a Church versus Turing thing in some respects uh, of how these have developed. And so uh, what I would like to say is that there are these two theories that we have that have had, I think, a very big influence on practice. So the, obviously the uh, American theory, which focuses primarily on algorithms and complexity, has had a big influence through uh, the development of many efficient algorithms for a broad range of problems, which made possible the computer world that we all live in today. And uh, it, it's, it's, I think, uh, uh, very much uh, deserving of recognition, the fundamental work that goes into making uh, computer systems possible. And I think on the... Uh, all, the same can also be said for Euro theory, particularly in language design and the development of verification tools. And in fact, some of these ideas are only now, I think, becoming uh, a matter of uh, practical uh, importance in like industrial settings, uh, where increasingly often uh, even companies, software companies, are relying on uh, verification techniques for saying something about programs and on languages whose design is grounded in a kind of mathematical theory. And I'll give a, a hint about that in a minute. So the interesting thing, and that's the kind of the basis for my talk, is that uh, unfortunately, at least in my experience, uh, these two theories of computer science kind of operate largely in isolation. And that means that, uh, for example, there's two separate sets of theory conferences. There's sort of the Fox stock theory and there's kind of Licks and Popple theory, and they pretty much have nothing to do with each other. And I think that that's a pity. And uh, I'm someone who, uh, I am an American by birth, uh, but I've done a bunch of my work uh, in Europe. I'm very frequently in Europe, and uh, a lot of my colleagues and people who I collaborate with are in Europe. But I'm also in the American context, and so I feel like I'm someone who has uh, an appreciation for both sides of this. And the subject of matter of this talk is to say something about how we might uh, kind of address it. So the way to explain, uh, the way I want to uh, attack this is by explaining uh, in a somewhat rather uh, uh, terse summary uh, the characteristics of the two points of view that makes them uh, difficult or what, what it is we wish to marry up and what makes the separation, what, what are the technical considerations, never mind any possible social considerations, just the technical considerations that separate the two points of view. And the thing that I would like to say is that uh, American theory, uh, algorithm analysis really, I'll just use those words interchangeably and don't mind me with my you know, broad sweep terminology, I meant it somewhat, somewhat uh, tongue in cheek. Uh, the, what I, and algorithm analysis is based on, uh, on machine models, all right? and particularly everyone in undergraduate computer science learns about, certainly in the US, learns about Turing machine or RAMs or something that is uh, essentially equivalent to that, which are a very low level description of computation which offer no uh, form of abstraction and most importantly, no I principles of composition. And that's the thing that I want to address. And the thing that is kind of interesting about these models is that they're, well, at least allegedly, very close to the hardware. I want to say something later about this allegation, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, the reason, and, and what I mean when I say the reason, I mean the technical reason. Let us not try to speculate about like historical, reason, historical accidents, but the technical reason I would say that machine uh, models are, are, are dominant in the, in the kind of uh, combinatorial theory and algorithm analysis is because they provide a very natural complexity measure. 
So you can talk about the time of a computation, it's just the number of instructions that are executed by a RAM or a Turing machine. These things are so minorly different from one another, it's not important to even bother to distinguish them. So we can just say the time consists of the number of instructions, and the space is like often described as tape usage when people think in terms of the Turing machine model with its uh, you know, tape, uh, infinite tape for, for storage, or the memory usage in a RAM. And that feels like a pretty natural thing because they emerge naturally from the machine models. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the nice thing about doing asymptotics is that it smooths over the differences amongst the models. So two tape Turing machine, whatever, blue ink and red ink or all the crazy things you could come up with, those don't matter at all with respect to the measures. In other words, the measures of complexity are of course well known to be robust across all of those changes. If, there, if they weren't, then they wouldn't be of much use. Now on the other hand, um, uh, oh, so uh, uh, before I get to that, so, but what you'd observe in practice is if you look at, for example, research papers or if you look in textbooks uh, when discussing algorithms, although the official story is that you know, it's a machine model like Turing machine or a RAM at the bottom, in practice people use some kind of C-like notation which is a little bit higher level, okay? And what is going on there, and if you look in the textbooks you'll see, what is going on there is what, what people are asking you to do is reason about the compiled code, although write it in a form that is a little bit more amenable to human understanding, something that's a little bit like C. So there's a, a, com a compilation model. You don't look at the source code, you say, oh, okay, there's a song and a dance, you know, there's a story about a control stack and some other mysterious things and that, are, that are describe how C is implemented and you're supposed to really reason about time and especially space in terms of those implementation strategies. This is you know, an improvement over working at the assembly language level, but it has a lot of drawbacks because it emphasizes uh, what uh, the terminology I'll use is ephemeral data structures, those that are, that, are, that are implemented by mutation or modification in place. I'll say something more about that. They give you something only, you have to deal with manual memory management. You have to worry about allocating space uh, manually and, and organizing when you're going to free space or not. They offer almost nothing in the way of composability, and I'll say something about that, and no idea of abstraction. There's no idea of dealing with a data structure as a thing in itself, as opposed to uh, something that is represented by words in memory and accessed by pointers and manipulated with address arithmetic and whatnot. You would just want to be able to say, oh, here's a mapping. Let's deal with the mapping as a mapping. So this is, these things are not offered in that kind of setting. So uh, on the other hand, if you look at what I'm somewhat calling, uh, uh, you know, what I'm calling Euro theory, is based on the opposite is on language models rather than machine models. And principally, the, the significant language model is the lambda calculus. And this is the uh, Church's formulation from the 1930s. And the thing about, your, about language models that I think is very good is that they're some way the exact opposite of machine models. They provide abstraction and composition. Those are fundamental. The starting point for, for the lambda calculus is basically the theory of variables the idea of a variable, a mathematical variable, which is maybe one of the greatest intellectual achievements of humanity in the whole history of humanity, is isolation of the concept of a variable which is based on which the lambda calculus is based. And moreover, it's very much platform independent, somehow the opposite of being allegedly close to the hardware. It's like, what hardware? I don't know anything about hardware. What I do is I reason and think in terms of the program that I write. Okay, that's what I mean by the language model, not how it's compiled or some story like this. Okay, so, and so the thing I would like to stress about this is that language models, like the lambda calculus, support composition via variables. And I draw an analogy here. I have two, two lines which draws an analogy between deductive reasoning and logic, the idea that you can uh, reason from a hypothesis, I could deduce psi from phi, and then separately, if I can ever prove, think of that as a hypothesis or a lemma, if I separately prove the lemma, then I know the conclusion is true. That's exactly the same process as the process of linking, of building up a program from a bunch of components independently and putting them together by a process of substitution. So something like the Unix LD tool is nothing other than an implementation of substitution for an extremely bizarre syntax. So uh, this is the, 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 the basic idea of the lambda calculus is to do that. So uh, the lambda calculus then, you know, in contrast to what I was saying with machine models, emphasizes it has other characteristics that are really quite the opposite of what we get there. So for example, the common case or the natural case are persistent data structures. Those for which you can take a data structure, I can take a mapping and make another mapping out of it. And if I want, I still have the old mapping, it persists. So things are not done by mutation. We have automatic memory management because we're dealing with abstract types. We just think of a mapping as a mapping. We don't worry about how it resides in memory and how we're going to lay that out. And therefore we get very strong uh, composability principles. 
And I think that is what makes language theory important, is language theory and type theory, which is really synonymous with language theory, is the theory of composition. Really, if you want to say a one-line nutshell definition, that's the whole point of type theory. The whole purpose of type is to address the problem of composition. And everybody knows that from the point of view of writing code, if you've ever written a line of code, you know very well that composition from components is central to getting anything done. And so I think that's, uh, that's, uh, and so that's where the emphasis, why we have the emphasis on the language side. On the other hand, to criticize the language theory, the Euro theory side, there's very little emphasis on efficiency. And in particular, historically, there have been no clear complexity measures. If I give you something in the lambda calculus, there's no idea has, that now has been developed. But historically, it was slow to develop an idea of what is the cost of executing such a program. That wasn't really, wasn't, wasn't really a sign. So, and, and therefore, there are very few analytic results about the efficiency of algorithms when phrased in this manner. So what I would like to say is, uh, although I mentioned here Chris Okasaki, who was a PhD student in my group uh, about mm, longer ago than I care to mention, uh, in the early 90s, uh, and uh, he, he is a notable counterexample, but there really has been very little analytic result about the efficiency of programs executed in r these natural and very, uh, I think, usable models of computation arising from the lambda calculus. So the tendentious claim that I would like to make for the purpose of having a stimulating talk, I, I, it's a sort of an art of being kind of entertaining and maybe annoying. So here's the annoying part of the talk. So the annoying part of the talk is that I wish to, uh, is I want to, I want to take, I want to stake a claim. I want to make a point here. And my point is, is that basically imperative programming methods, which arise from machine-based models, are completely obsolete. And in fact, in the future, we're not going to be programming this way. In fact, I think of imperative programming language models as analogous to a dial telephone. Some, um, almost all of you are probably too young to have ever known about dial telephones. But it used to be, you know, that, to, uh, that we would memorize 10-digit numbers to understand how to, how to call our friends. And we used to be able to have to mechanically move our finger in a distance proportional to the number in order to dial it uh, to figure out how to, to call someone. It is kind of absurd. Our kids will think that this is like ridiculous. They will, uh, the, they, in fact, they will think it's a joke. I mean, you can't possibly be serious. And I think that people will feel the same way about imperative programming uh, in, uh, in, in uh, not, very, not very long in the future. They'll think that these methods, these machine-based methods, are just too preposterous uh, for, for programming. So what I expect is that functional methods are going to dominate. And there are reasons for that that I will, the one of which I've mentioned is verification and composition considerations, which I'm not really going to into it all in this, uh, in, in this talk, and also because they very naturally accommodate parallelism, which at the very least is a significant technological trend, but I think is conceptually present in the lambda calculus from the get-go, and we shouldn't ignore it. And so that's something that I would like to mention. So I think, therefore, that the way forward is to synthesize these two approaches. And that's really the subject of my talk, is to somehow synthesize uh, the, the, the Euro and American theory so that we have reasonable language models in which to write code, but we also have a notion of efficiency with which to execute them. And in particular, I want to stress two considerations in this talk. One is parallelism, and the other is uh, what I will eventually describe as I.O. complexity. And we'll talk about that later. I want to talk about that to make a, to make a certain point that will come up a little bit later. Okay, so that's where I'm going. So the thing I would like to start with then is to review a little bit about uh, uh, you know, some, some interesting thing that has happened and what I, I'm calling in the history of the field what I'm calling a, a iatrogenic disorder, which is a, a doctor-induced disease, right? Uh, if you go to the hospital and you get even sicker, be, uh, maybe you catch something that's called a iatrogenic disease. And I think we have a, a, an example here of a iatrogenic disorder is the way in which some aspects of algorithms has evolved. Because if you look, I have on the on the next page, uh, this is just a photocopy. I went and pulled down from my shelf the, uh, the classic textbook by Aho, Hopcroft, and Ullman on algorithms, which anybody my age certainly is where they learned algorithms. There is nothing else. Younger people learn from other books, but this is a classic book. And if you look at that, uh, the description of quicksort, this is a quicksort up in the top here, I would say that like, is a completely beautiful, abstract, high-level description of quicksort that needs no further elaboration. Okay, what does it say to do? It says, well, basically, divide the thing into three parts, sort the parts independently, and put them back together. It's a divide and conquer algorithm. It is said directly. But then, what goes on, if you look in the whole you know, algorithms literature, and in fact, in that textbook and in subsequent text, textbooks like CLR or whatever, they make a horrible mess of this thing by programming at a machine level model. And they've completely lost the main idea 
Okay. So what I would like to do is I say, so somehow this went wrong. If you look at the original thing from the 1970s, right? This is a very old book. My book is practically falling apart. The binding is all broken and so on. I had to be careful when photocopying. I don't want to keep it for, you know, posterity. Uh, the, it, it's a very naturally parallel algorithm. There's nothing to be, there's nothing to like go into any great trouble to make it parallel. And it's extremely high level. It uses only a sequence abstraction. It just says, suppose you have a sequence of things. Never mind it laid out in memory, whatever, whatever. That's like nonsense, right? Just look at a sequence, divide it up into three parts, make, the, uh, make an organization of the sequence, do the sort, the parts, put them back together. So, uh, so and then, so, uh, you know, why did we ever leave that paradise? I, I, I don't really know. It's like a historical accident, although it's somewhat to do with, now Ellie will give me a hard time. Yes. It's an, it's an irrelevancy from the asymptotics, but I, I will get back to that a little bit. Okay, so, uh, so what I claim is that when you start reformulating this in a PRAM or in C code or whatever, something like that, you mutilate the algorithm. And then the whole thing becomes like a really complicated mess. And in particular, if you try to deal with parallelism and you're doing it in the, in the, in the framework of, a, like a, uh, of a, some sort of RAM framework, you're writing C code, you're very quickly involved in concurrency problems. And this is like a mess because what has happened is the parallelism is a matter of efficiency. If you're doing a quick sort and you have to do these two subsidiary sorts, let's do them simultaneously and with the idea that that will be more efficient than doing them sequentially. And that is just a matter of efficiency. It's not a matter of correctness. But if you're in a working in you know, low-level mutation-based models, you're instantly in problems of correctness now. You have to worry about synchronization, you have to worry about locking, or you have to worry about transactions, or you have to worry about non-determinism. And I don't see why we're doing that at all. It's not really necessary. It's actually just a disorder induced by using machine-level models. So what I would like to do is elevate the level of discourse, and I want to show you how we do this, okay? And I'm going to give you a little bit of flavor of this. So what I want to do is say, well, look, let's take something like the AHU or AHO, Hopcroft, and Ullman formulation. I'm going to put it into a slightly different notation, but it's really the same, the same formulation of the algorithm. And what I want to do is I want to say, how do you think about that directly as the code that you want to write? And think about that directly and understand its asymptotic efficiency. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a technique which is called uh, a cost semantics, which is a, an idea that was pioneered by Blalock and Greiner uh, around uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, and we've been developing further, which I will explain in a minute. And the idea is that what we're going to do is we're going to define an abstract cost measure of a certain kind to the execution of a language, of a, of a computation. And from that abstract cost, we're going to extract parallel and complexity, parallel and sequential complexity measures. So that's the, that's the high level idea. So let me show you how that's, how, let me show you how that's going to work, okay? So uh, uh, let me uh, come back to this uh, about the abstract cost measure in a minute before we say that. Well, let me go back, okay. So, okay, so we, we're gonna have the notion of abstract cost measure and I'll show you how that goes in a moment. Before I do that, let me just say the other thing is that the abstract cost measure is validated by what we call a provable implementation. Because the thing that you're going to worry about as I present this is that what stops me from writing down any abstract cost measure I want? What makes it, what makes it realistic or reasonable? And what, what makes it realistic or what makes it an honest cost measure is the notion of a provable implementation. And what that does is it transforms the abstract cost into a concrete cost on some hardware platform at, and with uh, taking into account considerations like number of processors, cache hierarchy, interconnect, and so on. So what we're going to get is a kind of end-to-end -end asymptotics. We'll be able to say something about the asymptotic complexity of an algorithm, how it will really run on a platform with specified characteristics, but with a clear separation of concerns that we have a program that's written in a nice composable functional language. We reason about its complexity at the abstract level, and then we transform that abstract complexity into a concrete complexity via the notion of a provable implementation. And so I'll show you how that works out. And in fact, this strategy is so simple that we actually teach it to first year undergraduates. So I would like to mention that we have completely revamped our introductory computer science curriculum at Carnegie Mellon. And freshmen who come in the door now learn uh, parallel programming verification techniques from day one using the methods that I'm about to describe. Okay, so how does this work? So let's look, I'm going to give you now some things that will get slightly technical, but I'm trying pretty hard to suppress uh, as many technicalities as I can.
So the key idea is to associate what's called a cost graph with the, uh, is associated with the execution of a program. So what we see, you can obviously see there's some blanks, uh, there's some things missing which I'll fill in in a minute. But what we see here is a standard specification of how you evaluate a function application. If I want to apply E1 to E2, I want to take a function and apply it to an argument, I figure out what function I'm, I'm going to apply. That's the first statement up there. E1 evaluates to this lambda. I, first, I then evaluate the argument to figure out what the argument is. Then I plug in the argument for the parameter in the body, just exactly the way you would think. It's like high school algebra. In fact, when we teach it, we, we teach students that programming is nothing other than, programs are nothing other than generalized polynomials. That's a way to think about it. You compute by plugging in and calculating and simplifying. So I plug in V2 for X, that's the parameter in E, and then I evaluate to that value V, and that's the whole value. So that's the way in which we would talk about it without taking, without in any way taking account of cost. If we want to take account of cost, what we do is we start decorating this with graphs. And these graphs represent, in a way that I will illustrate momentarily, represent a summary of what is going on with that program. In particular, they capture the dependencies among the constituent computations. In other words, they, uh, they make available, they, they make clear what are the opportunities for parallelism. And that's what is going to, be, going to be described here. So inductively, I can assume, just to show you how this goes, that G1 is the graph associated with E1, G2 is the graph associated with E2, and G is the graph associated with the executing the function body. So I have three graphs. And then inductively, what I do is I put those together, and I get this little graph that's described here, which I will go into in more detail in a moment, at the bottom. And what that thing is saying, what that graph is saying, and also I, I do want to mention, by the way, I, I should have said this earlier, so that you don't get the wrong idea. For some reason, I found this to be a, a common point of confusion. These graphs are entirely dynamic. They are not in any degree an approximation. They are not program analysis. It's not static in any form. Okay? It's a fully accurate record of what happens in the evaluation. So that's an important thing to understand about what we're doing here. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's worth mentioning. Okay, so let's see. So in order to explain this, so we had this, we said that the application has this funny cost expression going on here. And what does that cost expression mean? Well, what I'm doing is I'm building up what are called series parallel graphs, and I'll illustrate one of those in a moment. Series parallel graphs are built up from one, which is just a, a, represents a single unit of computation, doing some, some straight computation. Uh, the sum of two graphs, which says that G2 depends on the results of G1. So what I'm trying to do here is capture the data dependency. G, the graph representing the computation that G2 represents cannot run until the computation that G1 represents has completed. So that's what I mean by the sum. And then I also have the product, which it means that G1 and G2 are independent, that those can be run in parallel. So therefore, if you interpret the cost that I've assigned to the application that's given here, the one that's given here, what I'm saying is the function and argument are being evaluated in parallel. That's G1 times G2. And then there's one unit for doing the function call. You take one unit of work to actually do the function call. And then after that, you evaluate the body of the function. That's G plus G at the end. So that little uh, graph expression summarizes the dependencies structure of that computation. And so it gives us a way of understanding its complexity. Now, if you look at other, other uh, operations, for example, it, this is relevant to the Aho, a Hopcroft, and Ullman example I gave earlier, we can have like operations on sequences. So this is like, do a, apply a function to every element in a sequence. Well, we can do the same kind of analysis, and we start decorating these things with graphs, and as we decorate them with graphs, we discover that, well, we can evaluate which function we're going to apply and which sequence we're going to apply it to. That, that can be done in parallel. Once we figure those out, then we can evaluate all of those function applications to each of those elements in parallel. That's the middle part. And then there's one, one unit of cost to set up that computation and perform it. So that's the, uh, that's, and, to, and to create the sequence of results. So that's the, uh, that's the plus, plus, plus one there. And so that's what we have. So that's a description. So if you, okay, so, so what are these graphs good for and what does it have to do with understanding the efficiency of a computation? Well, to, do, to get to that, what we now is we have to take these abstract cost graphs and we assign two measures to them, the work and the, the, work and the span, or I will sometimes call it the depth. Uh, it's either called the depth or the span. The work is the number of nodes in the graph, the number of ones, count them all up. The work is the overall work, the number of steps that the computation takes, which can be thought of as its sequential time complexity. That's the amount of work you're doing regardless. It's gotta, that's the work that has to get done somehow. On the other hand, the span is the critical path length. It's the length of the longest sequ sequence of sequential dependencies. 
Okay? No implementation of that computation can possibly run faster than the critical path length because those are the things that must be done in a sequential order. So you could have a billion processors, but if your graph is one big long string, then you're not going to be able to take advantage of parallelism. So this is what the idea of the span is. So the span measures the idealized parallel complexity. So we have two measures now associated with a computation. So here's a picture of a series parallel graph. Uh, I just pulled one out of the hat. I, it doesn't have any particular meaning. It just shows you the structure. Uh, and it has work 11. There are 11 nodes in that graph. And its span is six. If you count on the right hand and then left zigzag, you can see there's a six level uh, dependency. Or is it five? It's five or six. No, six. Uh, uh, that are or five. Well, anyway, one number there, which is the, 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 the length of that, the length of the longest chain of sequential dependencies in that graph. Okay, so that's the idea of a series parallel graph. So if you look at, for example, something like merge sort, so I decided to do merge sort instead of quick sort, but its structure is really very much the same. The idea is that we can look here, this looks a lot like what we would have in, uh, in Aho, Hopcroft, and Ullman. It just says if you want to do a sort, you split the thing into two parts, you sort the two parts, and you merge them back together. And how do you merge these two things? You do a, a merge, which is comparing the elements on the two things and building up a sequence resulting from them. I would say this is a pretty much the simplest possible formulation of that code that you could give. Modulo very minor, minor differences of syntax. That's the, at the level that that Aho, Hawcroft, and Ullman example is written at. So there's an example so you can keep that in mind. And what we want to do is look at a little bit of the complexity of merge sort using this kind of cost semantics. So what we do is we, uh, we, think we, we analyze the behavior of this algorithm with respect to its work and its span or its work and its depth. And I'm not going to go through the, deal, the details here. We can, we can work this out. But the idea is that the sequential time, the work, is optimal. It's an optimal algorithm. It takes n log n time to sort n items because it's a sort by comparison. We know that that's a lower bound for sorting by comparison. On the other hand, its span, how deep, how, what is the critical path dependencies, depends a lot on how quickly you can split. Okay? And that depends on the representation you're using for the data structure that you're sorting those elements. If you commit a priori to some kind of list structure, sequential access to the, to the elements of the sequence, then you're going to have a problem because your span is going to be only order of n. On the other hand, if you do sorting on trees in a way that I'm not going to describe here, you can get the span down to log cubed of n, which is actually rather small. Okay? So for, and so this leads to the following idea which is the notion of the parallelizability ratio. The ratio of the work to depth is called the parallelizability ratio, which gives you an indication of how much is this algorithm going to enable us to take advantage of parallelism. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's not obvious that you can take advantage of parallelism. Any particular program may not exhibit a very high parallelizability ratio. For example, if you have a graph that is just one long string of dependencies, if you divide the work by the depth, you get one. Okay, it's constant. On the other hand, if you have a graph that is super wide, but d depth one, so it just fans out and then comes exactly back together, that's highly parallelizable because all those things can be done in parallel and the ratio will be rather large. So what we're looking for is a ratio that is large compared to the number of processors and that will come up in a minute. But one thing I want to say about this is I wrote the merge sort Okay, in a form that I hope is reasonably comprehensible, a very straightforward expression of what merge sort is. And I analyzed for you, without going into details admittedly, what its work and its span are. That is how it can be executed on a, par what is its parallelizability ratio? How can it be executed on a parallel processor? Every, the, everything I did there in that discussion did not alter the code in any way. There's no issue of correctness to do parallel programming. So a lot of talks, there are a lot of talks that start out, parallel programming is extremely hard. Let me talk to you about concurrency, okay? This is a non sequitur, okay? Concurrency has nothing whatsoever to do with parallelism, any more than concurrency has to do with sequentiality. The idea is that we want to look at the efficiency of things based on their inherent dependency structure and analyze the efficient, the, uh, the, our ability to execute them efficiently on a multiple processor by taking advantage of that structure. So it's an interesting thing that if you want to think of it as a debugging tool, you write your code sequentially. You don't ever think about parallelism and then it just runs on a parallel platform according to its parallelizability. And that can be analyzed using the techniques I'm describing. So that's what we're teaching. So now what I want to say is something about the provable implementation, and I will do this in the simplest possible form in order to give you the main idea. 
which is Brent's principle. So Richard Brent in the 1960s uh, was looking at how to compile algebraic expressions in Fortran on a parallel processor. And he came up with this idea. And it's a pretty obvious idea when you, when you, when you look at it. It says if you have a computation with work W and, de and span D, you can run that on a P processor PRAM in time maximum W over P and D. It's kind of obvious, right? Because as I said earlier, you can never beat the depth. If the depth is very, is very high, if the computation has many sequential dependencies, you're not going to be able to take advantage of parallelism. However, insofar as you can beat the depth, you can start doing your work W in chunks of P, which is your W over P factor, and that maximizes your use of parallelism within the limitations of the parallelizability ratio of the algorithm. Okay, so what happens is, uh, you, so that's it, that's the idea, that's the main idea of the proof of Brent's theorem. And the parallelizability ratio, the reason we're interested in that, is it tells you which factor dominates. Is it the W over P or is it the D? Okay, the ratio of W over D wants to be much bigger than P. That's the idea, okay? And then it'll be parallelizable because then the W over P factor will dominate. Okay, so that's how that works. And now the interesting thing about Brent's principle is it's a really a theorem, and it's a, and it's a theorem that has a constructive proof. And the constructive proof, what does it do? It exhibits a scheduler. It tells you how to schedule the workload onto, uh, onto processors. So let's, let's see how that works, okay? In order to see how that works, I want to introduce the idea of a pebbling of a graph, and I'm gonna illustrate that with an animation so that you can visualize what, what scheduling is all about. These cost graphs are not only useful for analyzing the work and the span of an algorithm, but they're also the data structure you need in order to do scheduling. So the way I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna talk about the idea of the pebble game or the pebbling of a graph. What we'll do is we'll say a, a schedule is a pebbling of a cost graph. And what is a pebbling? It consists of taking a number of pebbles, P, think of those as your number of processors. You start with a pebble on the initial node of the graph, and your goal is to put a pebble on the final node of the graph. And every move consists of, if every node, if its predecessors are pebbled, you can pick those up and put a pebble on that node. All right, that's what you want to do. That's what scheduling is all about. If you think P is the number of processors, what you're doing is saying the pebbling of the graph corresponds to how I assign work to the processors to get the overall work done in as quick a time as possible. There are different strategies for pebbling a graph, and those strategies correspond to graph traversals. And I'm going to show you here two of them, the first and the third, a PDFS and a P work stealing schedule. These are depth first search but doing, visiting P nodes at a time, P being the number of pebbles, or a work stealing schedule, which is best illustrated by example rather than me trying to define it for you. If you know about work stealing, great, you'll see how it aligns with work stealing. So here's a two DFS schedule. Here's the cost graph I gave you earlier, and the way in which we schedule this is pebble to graph. We put a pebble on node one, and we, let's say we're doing a two DFS, so I have two processors, right? So what's going to happen is I'm going to activate processors two and six. The processor six is in bold for a reason that I'll come back to in a moment. Okay, then uh, at, when those have finished, the next thing are three and four because I'm doing a, a depth first traversal. So I'll go, we'll think of this as an ordered graph. We're going left to right. And, uh, and I picked up the two pebbles from two and six and then I put them on three and four. And so I continue in this manner. At the next time, five and seven become ap uh, activated, then eight and nine as we go here, followed by 10 and then followed by 11. So you see what I've done is I've moved pebbles from the start to the end, and that pebbling corresponds to activating processors to work on the task, subject to the restrictions of the dependency ordering given by the cost graph. So that's a nice way to, nice way to think about parallel programming, I think. What a work stealing schedule is all about is best illustrated by, by example here. The way a work stealing schedule would work is somewhat different. What it would do is it would first divide up the work to two and six, exactly as I had mentioned before. But at that point, the two processors begin to do their own depth first search independently. And so what happens is, in this case, the next thing to be executed will not be three and four, but three and seven. Because the right-hand processor is busy and it does its own work on the right. The left-hand processor is busy and does its own work on the left. That's the way work stealing works. And so we then get four and eight as the next thing, and then five and nine, and then we get 10 and then 11. And notice that that last step between 10 and 11, only one processor is active. There's no possibility of using parallelism at that moment. You can imagine as the cost graphs get more complicated, more and more often you get to those kind of situations. That reflects the inherent parallelizability or non-parallelizability of the algorithm in question. This cannot be beat because these cost graphs are the exact record of the execution of the computation. It's not an approximation. So this is the reality. This is the thing that you have to deal with. 
The thing I wanted to mention a moment ago is the idea of, of uh, what I call a deviation. And you'll notice here that if we go back to the embolden six, I will uh, page back here quickly, in the embolden six, the thing I want to notice here is that if I were doing a one DFS, a DFS in, a, in other words, if I were doing a sequential schedule of this graph with only one processor, the next thing after two would, uh, after one would not be two and six, but rather two and then three and four. And the reason I want to, uh, so then, and in fact, the numbering that I use for those knowns is the depth first numbering of this graph. That's what I did. I, I numbered them with the depth first numbering. So the point about six being bold here is it's executed out of order. It is what is called a deviation. That is, the sequential ordering, the parallel ordering in the 2DFS is departing at that moment from the sequential ordering. It's not visiting them in the same order. There's a reason to care about this, and I'll, I, will, I will now uh, talk, uh, say something about these deviations. Um, sorry, I have to page forward. That's the problem with these animations. So there's a key idea here, which is to measure the number of deviations for sequential order. And the reason is the following. The deviations are a measure of the overhead of parallelism. Every time you have a deviation, you must have an interaction with the scheduler because that's how you deviated from the sequential order because you were interacting with the scheduler to know that some processor should be activated and are part of the computation that would not have been activated in a sequential order as yet. So you, it implies an, an interaction with the scheduler and moreover, it implies cache misses. Okay, because you're now going to be executing things in, in a, out of order with respect to their, their sequential ordering, and that is going to incur some overhead. So the deviations are going to tell us something about the efficiency of executing, the deviations in the schedule are going to tell us something about the efficiency of, of executing these programs. And in particular, my, our former student, uh, Dan Spoonhauer, has a number of nice results, uh, which is characterizing the space usage of schedulers, not just the time, uh, uh, in terms of the number of deviations. And a particular one is a quoted result here that I won't elaborate on about the, uh, the space usage of work stealing schedulers in the expected in the expected case. And that's, uh, an that tells you the number of deviations you can expect, and then the, the previous theorem tells you that you're going to use space proportional to the number of deviations. So, in other words, you can use that graph structure to understand quite a lot about what is going to happen without dropping down into a machine language level. That's what is really important here. So I'm, that's what I'm trying to get across. And moreover, you can then use those cost graphs for other purposes. So now I've said you can use them to measure the sequential and parallel time complexity. You can use them to talk about deviations in the scheduling because you can talk about schedules as pebblings of the graphs. Another tool, the other thing that Dan Spoonhauer developed is visualization tools for cost graphs that give us some idea about the space usage, like hotspots about where space is being held. I'm not going to explain the meaning of this graph. I just love the picture. I think it's really great. Dan has worked out a whole bunch of these. But what is going on here, the red edges are capturing the live data size with a situation where you're holding on to a lot of data. Okay? And it can often happen, by the way, that when, when executing things in parallel, that the limiting factor is not the parallelism, it's the space you're using. And that can be very surprisingly bad depending on the schedule. So Spoonhauer was analyzing the space requirements that are for different kinds of scheduling algorithms and using visualization tools like these to understand what is going on. So those graphs are useful for other things. We can do, uh, as I say, building like visualization tools to help us understand what's happening. So if I, I've mentioned, these, uh, these techniques are things that we're using in introductory CS uh, at, at Carnegie Mellon. These ideas of, uh, of cost graphs, thinking about parallelism this way, thinking about provable implementations, separation of concerns, using Brent's principle. Also verification, thinking about how do you prove these programs correct, using principles of compositionality, the central role of types in programming. This is all part of the freshman curriculum now. And for those of you who are interested in this, uh, I claim that, the, that what is really the tacit claim of our new curriculum is if you want to teach parallelism, you want to teach verification, which I claim you do, then you have no choice but to use functional programming. That is the right way to do these things. Lambda, lambda calculus models augmented with some account of efficiency in the, in the, perhaps in the manner that I'm describing here using cost semantics. And for those of you who are interested, I have links to um, the web pages. You can look at the courses and the material. We've redone, for example, all of our data structures, intro data structures and algorithms are all done in persistent data structures, parallel algorithms, functional programming right from the start. So we've gotten rid of all the imperative programming there, it's gone, okay? Everything is done now from, a, from the point of view of a parallel point of view in those uh, two course sequences. 
Okay, now I want to transition a little bit to saying a bit more about this, uh, this approach because I, I can anticipate that you have some skepticism about whether this, quotes really works. Well, I can't prove to you, uh, I can't, certainly can't resolve every possible uh, criticism. There are criticisms to be made. But I do want to like, address a few things, and I label this sort of fallacies refuted. And this comes back a little bit to what Ellie was saying earlier, so I kind of want to, when I put him off, this was the slide I was anticipating. Okay? So what I was saying is, is, that, what I, uh, is that very often people will say, oh, no, 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 the importance of machine models is that they are realistic, unlike language models. Well, I claim that this is not really true. But the argument for it is manual storage allocation is important to be realistic, manual scheduling is important to be realistic, uh, and things like primary and secondary storage effects, cache hierarchies or disk traffic and so on are relevant uh, to understanding the efficiency of your computation. They are. But the argument, the, the tacit and sometimes explicit argument is made that if you want to take account of those things, you must use a machine model. I claim that is false. Okay? And so because research has shown, the research developments that I'm outlining here have shown we can do uh, that automatic storage management is much faster and more robust than manual storage management. And automatic scheduling in the style I've just described uh, is both practical and very efficient way to think about parallel computation. So the thing I want to say in this, uh, this latter part of the talk is that the, even things like memory hierarchy effects can be accounted for cleanly and elegantly at the level of a cost semantics. So I want to talk a little bit about what is called the I.O. complexity of an algorithm, or I.O. efficiency. So a few years ago, Agarwal and Vitter, in the context of machine models, introduced what is called the I.O. model of computation. And the idea is it's a low-level machine model in which you distinguish, you're back to sort of RAM world, and you distinguish primary from secondary memory. And the idea is that you might as well, I, I personally end up thinking of it as cache and main memory, but it's an abstract model. You can equally well think of it as main memory and disk. Okay, that, it doesn't matter, okay, so it's abstract in this respect. I'll call it the cache, okay? So we have uh, a cache of size k times b, where b is a blocking factor, and m is the, is the size of the cache. And then what you do is you evaluate the efficiency of algorithm using m and b, these cache parameters, as parameters, with, uh, as figures of merit, is what we use to measure the efficiency of the algorithm. So one of their main results is that the k-way merge sort is optimal in the I.O. model, meaning that the number of, uh, the, the amount of I.O. traffic, the traffic between primary and secondary memory is bounded by the formula given here, and they prove that that is an optimal algorithm. And I'll just mention for specialists, the algorithm is not cache oblivious in the terminology of uh, Lyserson, but in fact the K, the parameter K, is chosen proportional to the ratio of M over B, but that's a technical aside. So what we got interested in doing is we want to match those results in a purely functional setting. It's a very interesting idea to introduce the I.O. model. I think it's a great idea. Um, I don't really want to be programming at that level, as I argued earlier. So what I would like to do is uh, sort of you know, match those results in the setting of purely functional pro uh, programming, where we have no manual mem memory management in a very natural way of writing code. So the key idea, which I'm not going to go into in great detail here, is to take advantage of the principle. We're going to arrange, through the idea of approvable implementation, we're going to arrange the temporal locality of objects. When I create objects in my computation, implies spatial locality. So the idea is that the allocation order in which objects are created as you're, as you're computing and you make up a data structure and you make a tree and you make a mapping and you make a pair and so on, the order in which those are created determines the proximity in memory. And what we're going to do is that proximity is going to be used to migrate them out in proximity to one another and load them back in in proximity to one another. So it's that, it's that, that is the critical idea. And, um, and then we, there's some I interesting subtleties that I can't go into here about managing the space required for the control stack to avoid contention with the, with the cache. So we account for all of that as well. That's uh, very much part of the work. In fact, I would say it's a big part of the work. So how do we do that? So I just want to give you like a little flavor of how this is done in order so you can see what the, uh, what the general strategy is. So you've seen already how I do evaluations and what that looks like. I don't know what that letter A, uh, what that letter A is. It's supposed to be an at sign. I, I seem to have had a, a, a typo there I just noticed right now. This means that E evaluates to V, just like before, except I make the storage explicit. So the idea is I have a store in which the various values that we're computing with are allocated in blocks of size B. We have a read cache of a certain size, and we have an allocation cache of a certain size. So I don't, I don't want to go into a lot of the details here about how that is done, but the, here is the crucial point. The crucial point is when I'm 
the, the idea about cost semantics is I get to assign whatever cost I want to a computation, and the only thing I have to do to keep myself honest is to back it up with a provable implementation that gives you the kind of bonds that I'm going to show in a moment. So in particular, I get to choose, uh, in order to measure the I.O. complexity domain algorithm, what I do is I choose that all operations that take place in cache are given the cost zero. And every other, like reads and evictions, anything else that requires me to go to main memory and pull it into the read cache or to evict something from the allocation cache are, are assigned unit cost. That way the cost measure is measuring just the traffic between primary and secondary memory and not uh, any other measurement. There's no, no, everything else is free. Everything else is completely free. So it's kind of a nice thing that cost semantics lets us do this. And then there's a provable implementation for it. And the main result of it is that if I do this cost assignment in the, man in the manner I described, we can actually implement this. This is the analog of Brent's theorem. We can implement this on a, on a stack machine with a sufficiently large cache. It turns out there's a formula, which is four times m plus b. Let's not worry about that. In, with cache complexity k times n. In other words, if the cache complexity, the abstract I.O. complexity is n, the actual cache complexity on the machine will be a small constant factor of n, like two or three times n. So in other words, I'm able to, the abstract cost semantics gives me an accurate prediction of what is really going to happen when we implement this on a real processor with a memory hierarchy. The ingredients that go into this theorem and the proof of this are Slater's uh, result, which tells us that least recently used cache policy is too competitive with the ideal cache model. The ideal cache model is you replace, whenever you do an eviction, you replace the thing that is going to be needed the furthest in the future. Of course, you can't, you can't compute that, but if you do LRU, it's too competitive with, with the ideal cache model, which means it's no worse than twice, in an amortized sense, uh, no worse than twice the cost. So we use that as a result. We use uh, Andrew Appel's result that copying garbage collection is asymptotically free because any garbage collection overhead can be amortized across the allocation sites for those objects, and we exploit that. And then we have a, a result that I cannot really describe in detail here, which is a, a, a tricky way to manage the control stack overhead so that we only get a very small constant factor overhead and don't interfere with the data objects in the cache. So the point being that the cost semantics, which is ascribed abstractly, is in fact a valid prediction about the I.O. behavior of your program. So that's the idea. So now if we look at merge revisited, uh, here's uh, the merge subroutine, or whatever you'd like to call it, of the merge sort algorithm. And there's one minor modification which was necessary, which I highlight here in red. I'll come back to what that means in a moment. But the rest of it is it's a straightforward. So my message is going to be the following. If you just write the natural code with this one, unfortunately, one modification I do have to make, uh, but if you just write the natural code, it has very good I.O. complexity. That is the idea. So we gave an analysis. And the analysis is, involved, uh, is a little bit involved. It involves the notion of compactness of a data structure. A data structure is compact if you can traverse it in time proportional to n over b. In other words, think of it as a list. Running down the list, we can say it's compact means that it's all close together so that when I traverse it, I'm going to go in blocks of b at a time. I'm going to take n over b uh, uh, I.O. steps. That's the only amount of traffic that I'm going to incur. So it's not spread out all over memory. It's actually rather tight. Okay, that's the idea. And then the main result is that if your inputs are compact, then the output of merge is compact and it can be done with cache complexity n over b. So that's the, the basic idea. And the only thing that we have to do in order to get that result is that this bang A and bang B here means uh, it's a really a copy operation. We're taking the, each element of the list. If it's a number, it just means create a new node and copy that number. If it were a more complex data structure, it would have to be a deep copy. And that's, uh, that's a concession. And, but this is the only way we were able to obtain the result. So uh, in all honesty, I have to admit that we're, that's what you have to do. Um, but the thing I want to mention here is that essentially the functional program doesn't, you don't need to do a lot of bureaucratic memory management in order to get good I.O. behavior. You do have to understand what you're doing, but you don't, you don't, it's a, you don't have to drop down to a machine model. And that's my point. So the summary then, uh, to finish up my talk, I think I must be near or over time. Uh, the, I think that the cost semantics is really, someone asked me earlier today, uh, you know, what is, the, uh, what is the one line summary of your talk? And I think the one line summary of my talk is, cost semantics is the key to integrating the two theories of, com of, of computer science. We get a usable parallel programming model through functional programming, and we get asymptotically accurate cost model for doing algorithm analysis. And so what I will finish with is say, what's not to like? 
Uh, and I think, and that's a, that will it, we uh, uh, give you an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, and I thank you very much for your attention. So, Ellie, what's not the like? The last program, what can we do to do? When you show the example of how often a woman, when you show the example of how often a woman, I could read it and understand it. Yeah. The last thing, the, the, the last program that you had, I saw something. It's the exact same it. thing. That's because you don't know ML syntax. Yeah. That's ML. It's the exact same thing. My main point is it's the exact same thing and that runs. You know, the AHO Hopcraft and Ullman doesn't run. Okay, so that's the important point. Now, what, the, oh. what I would like to have seen, there is a whole book that uh, actually I think should be attributed, maybe the American domain, by somebody who now almost runs Google, uh, Kudi Mulder wrote a book of algorithms. And the whole idea is if, uh, if programming is uh, in the very theoretical level is recursion. So when we write an That's algorithm, what I'm saying here, yeah. everything has to be a recursion. So I agree. wrote a book, of let's, uh, let's do algorithms now, teach algorithms as a recursion. Recursion is an idea, we'll explain it, and then we'll do the machine language and all these things, but the understanding will be at the level of recursion. That's, that's essentially what I'm saying. Recursion, yeah. that if you don't do the, the low level stuff, you don't know really what's going on. It's so complex, you get an idea, you know that you have a working algorithm, but you don't know what is the complexity until you work out the details. Well, but, so, uh, but uh, it, working out the details does not consist of assembly language programming, I claim. <laughs> question here. Yes. Um, this may be hopelessly Euro in orientation, but I, I like that you bridge with real hardware models, but also isn't there an argument to say theory should transcend today's hardware? For example, what if you're writing an algorithm that's going to be synthesized in hardware? Then truly you don't care about modeling details. You're making your own hardware, and I work in the area of real-time assessment where we care a lot about performance. We actually hate cache. We just want directly addressable different types of... Okay, well, I mean, I brought up cache complexity just because, A, that's what I've been working on recently, and B, uh, because it, I wanted to counter the allegation that, you know, everything you're doing is too abstract and you can't account for real things. On the other hand, what I would say to you in, in answer to, like, I think what your, what your major point is, is, you know, what we do is we separate this provable implementation. The, the platform characteristics are separated from what the algorithm is. So in particular, in the world of uh, machine models, the P is part of the code, and the number of processors you have is a part of the code. You have to write a different program for each choice of P. This is ludicrous. Okay, this is completely ludicrous. So what is happening here is that we are able to write, write the code in natural way, don't take account of platform characteristics, then map them onto the platform. So in particular, we could compile down to all kinds of platform, and it would be interesting then to understand other appropriate cost measures. I don't know exactly what they are, but there would be different cost measures are appropriate. So I just wanted to say, there are many cost measures in the world, and we can do various things. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Uh, my question was that you think, uh, aren't there applications where having state uh, helps us? Like uh, you're claiming that you can do everything in functional programming where we don't, uh, we don't maintain state or think about it. But yeah, well, you know, there are a lot of research in, for example, object oriented programs and object oriented languages. So so it's, it's a tendentious claim for a reason, right? I want it to be provocative. So, of course, the entire purpose of having a program, there's no point in having a computer if it doesn't side affect a person. Okay, that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the, of course, so of course. But the point is that the imperative programming model is a grotesquely exaggerated importance. Internally to what you're doing, the code that you're writing internally, so something, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to do something that you and I enjoy or find valuable. It's going to have an effect on us, of course. But internally to that, there's a vast array of things that can be done much better taking, uh, with taking account of verification and parallelism by working in a purely functional model. There's no reason to push imperative programming all the way down to the internals of the program. All the I.O., so to speak, should happen at the periphery of the program. Yeah, that's really, really what I, the point that I would make. That's the, the way we teach, uh, we teach about programming in the introductory course. Yes? What would happen if you apply this program to other kinds of declarative languages, uh, like programming or constraint programming, for example? 
Like what? Like what? Logic programming or constraint programming, other declarative. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know the answer to this offhand. I, the, the, I, what the, the, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, it's paradigmatic in the sense that there should be an operational semantics for the language you wrote. That should give you the opportunity to assign some notion of cost, which must be validated and made honest by approvable implementation that is of the flavor of the kind. So that's the high level answer. The detailed answer, I don't know the answer to that. I've never tried it. I don't have a, I don't know that I have anything useful to say, maybe beyond what I said a moment ago in answer to the earlier question. Technical question about your theorem at the end. Yeah. Does your proof merely refer and, and use the theorem that Appel has, or did you have to sort of the, the proof will well, you, those are the key ideas, okay? So what we do, the provable implementation, the proof of that theorem exhibits a compiler, basically, and tells us to how to organize the runtime system, tells us how to manage the nursery, tells you how to manage the control stack with respect to its cache behavior, okay? The proof embeds all of that information, which I didn't go into here. The key ideas come from Slater, from Appel, and then something we invented. It's a combination of, of three things, and I wanted to give due credit to like where I think the in insights come. Okay, so, yeah. How much does garbage collection affect the uh, connection between temporal and spatial vocabulary? No, the whole point is that garbage collection helps with, with ensuring that temporal, that uh, temporal locality implies spatial locality. So we have a copying collector and we block things up and migrate, write them out to memory in blocks and they come back with the same neighborhood. If, if some object was next to an object when it went out, it comes back in in the same form. So that blocking is extremely important and that's how we, uh, how we uh, analyze the, the efficiency of these algorithms with respect to I.O. complexity. So what, I, uh, what I'm really saying here, another way of saying what I'm saying is, the conventional runtime techniques for functional languages are essential to getting good I.O. complexity in, for code that is very natural and easy to write. That's another way of saying it. I have a challenge. I'm going to go and look it up after the talk. Okay. Yeah, I don't, rem I don't remember the assumptions of his model at this moment, and so I, I'm not sure that I can answer you meaningfully right now without going back and review it, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.